there, everyone! Welcome to episode number 621 of this year electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, my guest is Alex Urio from Avnet, and we're talking all about Avnet's recent insight survey. Alex and I discuss the motivation to create this survey, the skills needed to include AI capabilities into our designs, and the AI-related concerns gathered from this survey. A little later on, I also explore how mushrooms and coffee grounds can now be used as 3D printing material and how this material could be a resilient alternative to plastics. But first, please welcome Alex to Fish Fry. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, so Avnet just launched your fourth annual Avnet Insights Survey. So, Alex, what was the motivation to create this survey four years ago? I think that, you know, in our constant search and and desire to create solutions for our customers, to be able to survey them on what we think, you know, is important, right? But then have them corroborate that. And then, you know, from those initial offerings to be able to build our solution portfolio and strategy going forward. I mean, this one, obviously, you know, and probably a little hotter today than it was yesterday, but the subject of, if that's even possible, you know, which I refer, but uh, AI is probably the hottest topic on everybody's mind. So that'd be a perfect example, right? You know, we know that's happening, but we'd like to get into some of the specifics from our suppliers. How are you using it internally, externally? You know, where do you see your needs are? And then obviously for us, it's to take that data and be able to configure, you know, optimal solutions for those customers. For sure. Now, Alex, what was the overall feeling from this survey? Are engineers feeling more or less optimistic these days? I think engineers are feeling more optimistic, you know, and you see that in the results of the the survey. But when you really hone in on the application, if you will, of AI, I think that's where it gets really exciting. When I say application, right, that's kind of a general term. I'm talking about the application to improve their internal design processes, right? You know, we learned a long time, anything we can digitize, you know, we should. But then most important for us at Avnet is how you embed AI functionality capability in your end products, right? The edge community, if you will. And, you know, when you think about it, Amelia, as we watch this progress, you know, it certainly starts with the hyperscalers and maybe hyperscalers plus. I heard them referred to as the Magnificent Seven the other day, but that's where the action is today. You know, obviously, and maybe in some respects concurrently, we're starting to see the embedding of those functionalities in PCs or in phones. I'm getting a little tired of the commercials, as I'm sure you are too, but it's all worth it for us because we can wait for, you know, the ultimate opportunity for us, which is AI at the edge. And to hear 42% of the respondents talk about the fact that they're embedding these kinds of functionalities in their end products, that's exciting to us from an opportunity standpoint. Maybe that's a really long-winded way of saying that it validated what we thought, uh, confirms what we thought, and then gives us the license, if you will, to go build those capabilities to be able to allow customers to maximize the need. Let's talk a little bit more about AI. Questions around emerging AI technology was part of the survey, right? So talk to me about the interesting information you learned there. Interesting in terms of the functions of AI. I mean, it would almost sound like an abmercial, but it stays under the heading of validating and confirming what we perceived. You know, we made an investment, gosh, five years ago, six years ago, in an IoT strategy. And that IoT strategy is basically the furthering of an IoT gateway, a platform called IoT Connect. Over the years, we've morphed. You know, my kids aren't young enough to use the word morph, but we've changed the solution into really a silicon supplier facing solution. And I'll tell you what I mean. You know, the top microcontroller manufacturers in the world, you know, all of which are on our line card, to characterize their devices, to be able to operate them within our platform and address 
the kinds of issues that you saw come out in the survey in terms of what their biggest fears are, secure data, you know, data latency, I don't know, again, that can be a fear, but, you know, speed of data, those sorts of things, interoperability of devices, having a sandbox development type environment, because when you're dealing with the leading edge microcontroller devices, whether it's, you know, PSOC from Infineon or Sam Ells from uh, Microchip or various Renesis products, NXP products, these are AI at the edge microcontrollers. And the implication is clear. If a designer is putting them in their products, they're going to want to communicate with the net, which then immediately gets us into what all those issues are, right, in terms of security, privacy. I mean, you know the list, Amelia, as, as well as I do. And to have a solution to be able to go to market at the time and point of need is really exciting to us. So kind of validated that overall strategy and approach to IoT as it relates to AI at the edge. That makes sense. So also talk to me about the skills needed to include AI capabilities into our designs. If nothing in our 102-year history we've learned to be, that's adaptable and adaptable very specific along the lines of what our customers require. We specifically talked in the survey about the types of skills that are required today, maybe a little bit different. I was kind of looking through the survey. I'm at the point where we're talking about the product functionalities, but the actual skills associated with embedding, if you will, AI into your products and what skills do you need? You know, obviously the data analysis skills would be at the top of the heap. You know, design tools that are oriented and characterized for AI applications. You know, I think those would be the two that would come to mind immediately. Fantastic. All right, Alex. Well, I think it is time for your off the cuff question. So, Alex, you've been doing some fun stuff over the weekends with all your brothers coming into town. So, tell me one cool thing you've done during these family trips. We're a very close family. We range in age, uh, seven brothers from 68 to 56. We all graduated from the University of Illinois. We were all in the same fraternity at the University of Illinois. We have con calls every week for University of Illinois sporting events. We're a very close-knit bunch. So there's no one event. It's just when we're all able to get together and we've all done pretty good in life, you know, to be able to do this thing routinely, that's the coolest part. When I saw your original questions, and I know how you operate, Amelia, I knew there'd be one of these questions in there. So you had the, if you could have dinner with one person alive or dead, you know, who would it be? And my answer was, was going to be Jimmy Buffett, you know, although recently deceased, that's another thing I share in common with all my brothers. And he's just been really important to our family in terms of a philosophy kind of thing. I can tell you that for 30 years, my mother, before she passed away, wrote letters to Jimmy Buffett and told him that they had a party every year before the concert and that he should come. And then after these letters went on for years and years, we got front row seats in the middle of the stadium and we rolled out a big banner that said, we're the Urios and are you coming to the party? And he paused the concert and pointed at me and said, your mother writes those letters. How about that? Yeah. So I don't know how cool that is for a podcast, but you got me thinking about it with the question. Can we go back to technology? Because I'm a softie, as you see. (laughs) That is so cool, Alex. I love that. As a big Jimmy Buffett fan myself, oh, man, I would have just died. Fantastic. But he never came to the party. And of course, there's no chance now. Of course. Yeah. But that was good enough. I mean, thousands and thousands of people called out your mom. Ah, so great. Well, Alex, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me yet again. Anytime, Amelia, I always enjoy it. Thank you. Here on Fish Fry, I love a good 3D printed story. I've covered a variety of interesting, weird, and truly strange 3D printed technologies over the years. And this one, my friends, falls perfectly within at least one of those categories. Did you hear that a group of researchers from the University of Washington, led by Dan Lee Lau, have created a system to turn coffee grounds into a paste that can be used to 3D print objects? And not only that, when they added some reishi mushroom spores into that paste, they were able to create a fully compostable alternative to plastics. 
All right. So every year, Americans consume somewhere around 1.6 billion pounds of coffee. And from those billions and billions of cups of joe, around 1.1 billion pounds of coffee grounds are sent to garbage cans or compost bins. But maybe we shouldn't be so quick to send those grounds to the compost or landfill. Because, according to this study, we could be missing out on a great way to 3D print a variety of objects. And this study proved that by printing a statue, packing materials, and parts of a vase. So why coffee? Well, coffee is nutrient rich and is sterilized during brewing, which makes it a perfect material for growing fungus. And the first step in that process is when a mycelial skin is formed. Now, this skin is a type of white root system which, important to this study, can bind loose substances together to create a water-resistant, lightweight, and tough material. And in this case, that skin turned that coffee ground paste, even when it was formed into complex shapes, into a resilient, fully compostable alternative to plastic. Now, in the case of those vase pieces, that mycelial skin actually fused separately printed pieces together to form a single vase. Okay, so this is how they did it. Lau and his team made a paste of coffee grounds with brown rice flour, reishi mushroom spores, xanthan gum, and water. UW's Machine Agency Lab had previously designed a new 3D printer head for their Jubilee 3D printer that could hold up to a liter of this paste. Now, the process to create this paste is actually pretty similar to your grow your own mushroom kits. The key is to keep the mycelium moist as it grows from that nutrient rich material in this case, the coffee ground mixture. If the pieces stayed in the tub longer, actual mushrooms would sprout from the objects. <laughs> so the researchers dried the pieces for 24 hours, which stopped the fruiting of the mushrooms, but kept that mycelium layer in place. So what is this material like? Well, this team contends that it's heavier than styrofoam and has a density that is closer to charcoal or cardboard. And get this, after an hour of contact with water, it only absorbed around 7% more weight and also dried closer to its initial weight and kept its original shape. So... Are we going to be seeing coffee and mushroom 3D printed objects coming along anytime soon? Well, no, that's doubtful. Since scaling this technology will be a bit tricky, since this mycofluid, as they call it, needs relatively homogeneous used coffee grounds. But this team is interested in other forms of recycled materials that could form similar biopastes. Lau says this about the future of these kinds of recycled materials for 3D printing. We're interested in expanding this to other bio-derived materials, such as other forms of food waste. We want to broadly support this kind of flexible development, not just to provide one solution to this major problem of plastic waste. Super cool, right? <laughs> so if you want even more information about this study or to check out Avnet's recent insight survey, I've included a slew of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, you can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. 
and we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of February 28th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.